Our session showcases resilience efforts and programs and actions across our four southeastern states and two U.S. territories. Um, as you've probably gotten by now, we have quite a bit of uh, content for our meeting, both from uh, the U.S., southeastern states and Caribbean territories, as well as international Caribbean for us today. Um, and this focused, this session is focused on the U.S. efforts to build resilience, develop adaptation stat strategies, understand future conditions, and speed recovery from disasters. We have representatives from state and territory coastal management programs, offices of resilience, and regional organizations with us here today to give you a flavor for some of their most recent uh, approaches to resilience and recovery in order to give the speakers the maximum amount of time possible to share their perspectives. I'll keep my comments brief. I did want to let you know that uh, we will be keeping our uh, questions for all speakers until the end, and we'll um, have time for a few questions, and we're followed by a break um, in which you can follow up with other speakers in case there's not time. And. Without further ado, I'll introduce our first set of speakers. I'd like to welcome Brian Byfield and Mackenzie Todd from North Carolina. Uh, Brian is the Resilient Coastal Communities Program Manager for the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resilience. He's an urban and regional planner with more than 25 years of experience in 11 states, and he began his uh, career in Jamaica. Mackenzie Todd is the Resilience Program Specialist for the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management, and she previously worked as the Planner and CRS Coordinator for the town of Moorhead City. So I welcome Brian to kick us off and Mackenzie to, uh, to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this is our clicker. <laughs> so greetings from North Carolina. Thank you uh, for being here and welcome. Um, we are a rapidly growing state. Uh, Georgia, we're coming for that spot that you have in the southeast now. But therein lies some of the issues that we we are, we are having. So I'm going to talk to you quickly. Um, Mackenzie and I are splitting eight minutes, so we'll see how that works. Uh, I'll give you two. <laughs> um, so in terms of our resiliency planning, as, as, as was mentioned, I'm from the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and we're trying to do a, what we're calling a Swiss cheese model. Many layers to help us achieve what we want with no single layer being the perfect sort of solution or, or, or one thing that fits all. So sort of at, at the state level, there are a couple of things that are happening. Um, just wanted to highlight a few. The risk assessment and resiliency plan has been developed. It was developed in 2020 and asked agencies to uh, put their plans in place and to work in a coordinated fashion towards coming up with with solutions and strategies for improving climate resiliency. And these 12 agencies are state agencies. Um, the, the latest thing that's happening now is what we're calling the flood resilience blueprint, looking at understanding in detail what happens in flood, flooding across the different watersheds across the entire state. So watershed planning doesn't sound like anything new. Um, but we're going back to it and looking, taking a different lens and using uh, modern technology and ideas to, to work through that. And you can grab me after and, and ask any questions if you want to know more about that. Uh, things are also happening at the county, municipality, uh, nonprofit sector stages. We're doing heat assessment, tree canopy evaluations, using smart data. Uh, green agriculture and so on and so forth. So state, county, municipal, and regional levels. And I'll talk a little bit about regional levels. Uh, Mackenzie and I, we work under a program, Resilient Communities Program. I'm going to talk a few minutes about RISE. Uh, again, stressing that economies and the environment are not separate issues. So RISE is uh, recently, or will be concluded in March of this year, a 
program funded initially by the Economic Development Administration and later by the CDBG Mitigation Fund to look at developing a resiliency guide for folks, a planning guide for all kinds of communities, whether they be complex cities, small groups, or, or smaller counties. Uh, homegrown leaders, capacity, addressing the issues of capacity building, uh, trying to get more folks into the field, thinking about climate resilience and understanding how this works with their, uh, their, their field. Uh, we're also developing a program where we went through and we did vulnerability assessments at the regional scale, and by regional we, may, we mean multi-county scale, to look at what are the issues that are affecting each region locally, and then coming up with particular projects to help address some of those issues. So RISE took place across this eastern half of North Carolina. And sort of some of the quick outcomes from that, we had 49 counties addressing issues for 3.2 for 3 you know, million folks, nine regions working with the councils of government as a regional body, addressed stakeholders. You can t I can talk to you about stakeholder engagements and all its issues for days on end, um, if you grab me. Um, but we ended up with nine vulnerability assessments and ended up with more than 55 regional resiliency projects um, and we're in the process of moving those projects from concept to actual activity. It, sort of as you transition to RCCP, what Mackenzie's going to talk about, we had similar structures. Um, the big difference here is that we were working at the regional scale versus the RCCP program which was working at the local level. So I think I've gone to seven minutes. Does that leave you any? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, good morning. As Brian said, my name is Mackenzie Todd, and I'm the Coastal Resilience Specialist for the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management, which is basically the dream job. So thank you all for having me this morning. Um, Brian did a lot of uh, good background for us. So as he said, RISE takes that regional approach to resilience, and our office is taking a more localized approach. Um, we received our funding from the General Assembly and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and then we got to work to uh, start building resilience in our 20 coastal Cama counties. That is where we have our scope of work. So the program objectives, the Resilient Coastal Communities Program, which we call the RCCP, really works to address barriers at the local level. We want to assist communities with risk and vulnerability assessments. We want to help communities develop a portfolio of well-planned and prioritized projects. And then we want to advance those projects to a shovel-ready status, meaning that they're ready to go if they receive any kind of grant funds. And then with that, linking communities to all these funding streams that are coming down the pipeline. There are four phases to our program. The first two phases run concurrently, and that's what we call the planning phases. Uh, during that time, the community really engages with each other. They perform a risk and vulnerability assessment, and then they develop a portfolio of those well-planned and prioritized projects. In phase three, um, they take one of those projects from the portfolio and get it through the engineering, design, and permitting. And then phase four is the implementation. So phase four grant money will be available for communities that um, get through phases one through three, and then we can get their project constructed. So the very first round of phases one and two occurred from 2020 to 2022. It was a very interesting time, as we all know, COVID was going on, and it was just myself and my boss at the time managing 26 communities and 10 contractors. Um, it was probably some of the best times of our lives, so it was exciting. <laughs> um, so we had eight counties and 18 municipalities participate in this first round. They were our guinea pigs, and um, we had about $775,000 total to split between those communities to get risk and vulnerability assessments done, mapping, community engagement, and then ultimately get them a portfolio of prioritized projects that they can use for other grant opportunities. So this map shows um, the communities that participated, and we selected them based on an application process. Um, we were looking at their level of vulnerability, um, their capacity. A lot of these small coastal towns only have one town clerk or one staff person doing everything. Um, and then the 10 contractors in that table, we matched them with the community 
and we contracted with them directly so the community didn't have to do any of the procurement burden. Um, and we were told that that was a big plus. So ultimately, um, that led to a lot of lessons learned. <laughs> Um, we did an evaluation process at the end of the first two phases. Um, we had a working group that Brian was a part of um, with our program partners at the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the North Carolina Sea Grant, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, so we kind of came together and started looking at the 26 resilience strategies that were coming in that were um, a couple hundred pages long and looking at maps and looking at their, their project portfolios and really began to start tracking themes and gaps and areas for improvement um, for, you know, for future rounds. So the working group process, um, that is actually a snapshot of some of our uh, <laughs> chicken scratch um, handwriting there, but uh, we had about five members working on this and we went from meeting monthly to weekly where we reviewed all deliverables, tracked the themes, and then we had a one day workshop where we kind of pulled everything together and took it to a larger steering committee to get approval for uh, future recommendations. So those were, um, we have a long list of edits to our program planning handbook. That was written uh, by myself, my colleague at the time, and my coworker. So there's always room for improvement there. Um, we're working to add more content to that, create a technical appendix, um, and, and just make that a better resource. We also need to develop a required training for our contractors. Um, we wanna provide more community um, training in terms of climate change and nature-based solutions. We wanna incorporate more um, information on the different kinds of North Carolina-specific climate data we have, nature-based solutions, and then ultimately develop some kind of um, academy or, or just some uh, resource where we can have a bunch of case studies and resources for the communities to look at. And so now that we've done this first round, we'll have, we'll have lots of examples of those. So next steps, where is the program now? We are currently in phase three, which is the engineering and design. So those communities from the first two phases have now moved into engineering and design of one of their projects. Uh, 20 of those were awarded for a total of 1.12 million, and that is anticipated to wrap up this May. We're working on those program planning handbooks with my colleague, Kaysen, who's here. He's put a lot of work into that. Um, that handbook will be updated and released this spring. And then we're also in the application round of our second round of phases one and two. So we took those lessons learned and we're fixing everything we can and those applications are open and due to us February 3rd. So we'll take another uh, set of communities through that phase. And then phase four, um, the construction phase, will open up this spring. So those engineered projects will be able to apply for construction money. So lots of stuff up in the air, but it's, it's very exciting. And this is just a table of those phase three projects and their award amount. And you can also find that on our website. And I also can take questions at the end or you can come grab me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brian and Mackenzie. That was just such a great um, overview of exciting efforts in North Carolina. Next, I'd like to welcome Alex Butler from, the, uh, from South Carolina. He is the planning director for the South Carolina Office of Resilience, where he oversees the development of the state's first statewide risk, uh, uh, risk reduction and resilience plan. Prior to his current role, Alex managed the water quantity permitting section at DHEC, the Department of Health and Environmental Control, and uh, worked as a hydrologist, both for DHEC and Department of Natural Resources in South Carolina. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. A uh, quick shout out to Joel for getting these slides in at the last second. I really appreciate it. Um, just real quick, we're, we're a new agency, so I want to make sure everybody knows what our mission is. In fact, our agency didn't exist the last time y'all had a, a live meeting. So. Um, our mission is to lessen the impact of disasters on communities and citizens of South Carolina by planning and coordinating statewide resilience, long-term recovery, and hazard mitigation. Uh, so a quick history of, of how we got to where we are. Um, we were formed after the 2015 floods that were a result of uh, Hurricane Joaquin, an atmospheric river parking itself over South Carolina, a pretty devastating flooding event. Uh, Governor Haley at the time pulled a couple cabinet agents couple members from each cabinet agency and created a disaster recovery office uh, to coordinate that recovery, um, which was good because then we had subsequent disasters in 2016 and 2018, so we were managing uh, three disasters at once. Um, Governor McMaster uh, decided that we should quit being so reactionary and that we should start being a little bit more forward-looking. So he created the Flood Water Commission in 2018, 
Um, and one of the recommendations of that Flood Water Commission was that there should be a statewide office uh, to coordinate such activities. And so in 2020, uh, the legislature passed and the governor signed the act that created our office, but they didn't give us any money until 2021. So just want to point that out that we didn't really start until 2021. Um, so what we currently do is we, we do resilience. Um, like like uh, Lindy said, we're working on the state's first, watch, first statewide resilience plan. Uh, we also have a mitigation program that's funded with a HUD grant. Uh, so we're doing things as buyouts, infrastructure projects, plans and studies projects. Uh, we have some matching grants. And then we also have our disaster recovery mission. Quick shout out for our disaster recovery side of things. Um, we have closed our 2015 HUD grant um, on time, which is pretty rare. Uh, and we have finished construction in our uh, Hurricane Matthew grant, and we'll close that out on time. So quick to resilience planning. So I've heard, already heard a couple definitions of resilience today, and, and we thought it was really important when we started this process to define what we were talking about from our office's standpoint, we're talking about resilience. And so we define it as the ability of communities, economies, and ecosystems within South Carolina to anticipate, absorb, recover, and thrive when presented with environmental change and natural hazards. So South Carolina, in blue, you know, we have to think about the entire watershed of South Carolina. So we have to worry about our good friends in North Carolina um, and Georgia as well about what they're doing, especially North Carolina. Um, a lot of that water that, that falls in North Carolina flows through our PD system, and we've had uh, repetitive flooding in that area. Uh, we have a growing population, so we're, you know, we're expanding, we're getting close to 6 million people, um, which I know sounds small when you're in the city of Miami and they're um, you know, over half that, but you know, we're, we're a growing state and we're having to deal with those consequences. Our growth is not equal, so this is just our PD re region counties, so kind of the um, northeast quadrant of the state. Uh, you can see that one of these counties isn't like the others, right? This is Horry County which is Myrtle Beach, for those that aren't familiar with that. But you can see that the population in that one county is just exploding. Uh, we're dealing with a warming climate. I don't have to tell you all that. Um, we're seeing a warming trend across our climate, uh, across the state. Uh, we anticipate that to continue. On the precipitation side, uh, there's a lot of variation. We don't see a, a strong trend um, on annual precipitation, but what we, what we do see is an increase in the number of um, high intensity events. So we've had repetitive flooding in our PD region. Um, some areas of the state have, have had 3,000 year events um, over a five year period. So it's just kind of incredible that all those happened um, in the state. We're deal dealing with a rising sea levels. Um, so if we're talking about Charleston, uh, maybe another city you're familiar with, uh, we already have problems with high tide flooding. Uh, people have to com plan their commutes around it. Um, that's going to increase and it's going to continue. And it doesn't matter which emission scenario you look at. You know, by 2100, pretty much every day, there's going to be tidal flooding in the city of Charleston. So we've been working on our flood vulnerability assessment as part of our planning. A um, few of y'all might know where this is. This is downtown Columbia in South Carolina. The blue areas are the FEMA mapped areas. Um, the red areas are from a, a data set from the First Street Foundation that show our 100-year flood risk. And I would just want you to point out that those areas extend where the FEMA maps don't. And that's what we see across the state, is that the FEMA maps do not capture the full flood risk of the state. So we're, we're relying on this data set from the First Street Foundation to kind of uh, capture our full flood risk. Um, and so you see the, the big red spot over there on the left, right next to where it says Shandon. That's an entertainment district in Columbia called Five Points. It floods if you look at it wrong, but it's not, it's not picked up in the FEMA maps. Uh, we've also done some online surveys to get some uh, input from folks to where they're experiencing flooding, and we can overlay, overlay that with the FEMA maps as well as the First Street maps and see where they line up. The little flags are survey responses we received. Um, you can see there's a lot of them that are in the First Street's data. None of them are in the FEMA maps. Um, so where people are experiencing flooding tends to be where the First Street's data is picking it up. There's also a cluster right in the downtown uh, area there of Dillon that tells us something as well, tells us it's likely a stormwater issue, right? It's probably undersized stormwater system that we need to look at. So we take all that data and we can say, what does that mean on the statewide scale? Um, if we look at properties that are vulnerable to inundation of greater than a foot in a 100-year event, um, that's the distribution map across South Carolina. So it's a, it's a big problem that we're dealing with when you look at it at that scale. We take that same data, overlay it with other data sets, the solid waste facilities. Obviously, there's an issue if we start having mobilization of contaminants, so we want to make sure that we're, we're understanding where we're at risk and where we're vulnerable. 
and also our commercial uh, facilities. We can start to get an economic cost. I know these numbers are real small. You can't read them, but you're in the you know 300 millions per each little huck 12 um, up there uh, for a 100-year event. So what we're currently working on, uh, now that we've completed the vulnerability portion of our planning, is developing recommendations for action. And, and we have, we divide them back into our four quadrants that go with our definition. So we, what can we do to anticipate, absorb, recover, and thrive? So when we're talking about anticipate, we're talking about things like improved data collection and coordination, uh, making sure that the state agencies are talking to each other, we're talking about education and outreach, partnering with uh, partners like South Carolina Sea Grant, um, planning, zoning, land use, those sorts of things. On the absorb side, we're talking about things like design standards, things like lands conservation, building codes, uh, community services that can help folks, as well as stormwater system maintenance. Be surprised about the amount of flooding that's just from basketballs stuck in stormwater drains. Um, Recovery side of things, you know, looking to coordinate state and federal disaster funding. Um, you know, we have several state agencies that work on that. There's several federal agencies that work on that, and then they don't always coordinate well. So trying to figure out how can we best coordinate that effort. Um, we also have a, a reserve fund at our disposal to help with that. Um, currently sits at $44 million, I believe, but that would be gone in a minute if we were to have an actual disaster. And then the thrive section is hopefully we do all these things and we don't have another disaster, but there's also benefits to this, right? There's benefits to our, to our economic systems, there's benefits to our ecosystems, and our benefits to our communities if our systems just function better. So just a quick, um, one of the things we've been doing is, is looking at conservation. Uh, our governor is really uh, big on conservation and we appreciate that. So we wanted to look at conservation through a flooding lens. Um, so we've created a, a statewide map and you notice it extends into North Carolina. Um, if y'all want to copy it, y'all can have it. Um, <laughs> because water doesn't follow political boundaries, right? So for some areas in South Carolina, the biggest bang for their buck in land conservation is actually in North Carolina. So we need to be thinking across county boundaries, across state boundaries, um, and really trying to identify those areas. So you notice a lot of low-lying riverine areas. I think that's the easy uh, thing to pick out, but we've also identified those areas that are good soils where the water currently infiltrates um, so we can make sure that we're you know, keeping that storm water from entering the system to begin with. And just a quick example of uh, a local watershed where we've done that. We've done this for each of our uh, Huck 8 watersheds. And with that, feel free to connect with us, and I'll take questions after everybody else. Great. Thank you, Alex. And thanks to each of our presenters for putting an impressive amount of information in just eight minutes. So. <laughs> Sorry if it's a little bit quick, but I uh, wanted to make sure that we were highlighting all these wonderful efforts. Next, I'd like to welcome Jill Andrews, who is the Chief of Coastal Management at Georgia's Department of Natural Resources Coastal uh, Management Division. She, <clears throat> she oversees the Georgia Coastal Management Program, uh, which seeks to proactively address the unique challenges of, coastal, of the coastal zone. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Jill. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. This is my first trip to an SCDRP meeting. Um, I, th I think I di did dial in last year a little bit, but this has been really impressive and a tough act to follow from the mayor and the UN. I'm going to do my best. Uh, so I'm going to give you an update on what's happening in Georgia relative to our resilience efforts and coastal hazards management. Um, so just overall, what is Georgia working on uh, for the coast? Our vision is resilience and working at the local level. Um, I'll say we're kind of hyper-focused down at that local level, keeping in mind that everything that we're trying to do is um, to create actionable um, strategies and solutions for our coastal communities. We do provide training and technical assistance, a lot of one-on-one -on -one with those communities, but we also fund and um, work with our partners to get the necessary research data and information um, so that we can put good information into plans and ultimately achieve adaptation at the local level. Okay. So resilience in Georgia does look a little bit different than some of our other states. We do not have a state office of resilience, so we do have a lot of agencies working on different things through their own efforts. Um, for example, hazard mitigation plan now is considering climate change, particularly coastal um, effects and sea level rise, um, work at the Department of Ag, lots of work coming out of our universities. Um, community affairs and public health agencies, forestry. Um, we've also engaged the Georgia Chamber of Commerce in looking at uh, the economics of climate change and adaptation. So a lot of good things happening across the state. A big effort, though, in the coast is trying to keep all those activities coordinated and aligned and working together and um, working efficiently. So Georgia CZM, the Coastal Management Program, and our partner at Georgia Marine Extension and Sea Grant have been hosting the Georgia Coastal Hazards Community of Practice for over a decade now. 
Um, so lots of members from a lot of these different agencies, but also our nonprofit partners, um, our research and academia partners, um, as well as other agencies coming together on a routine basis to talk about what it is everyone's working on, um, but also to really elevate the needs and the gaps that we have in our climate um, adaptation and resilience work going on. So real effort to engage everybody and keep the needle moving forward. Um, for Coastal Management Program, one of our first forays into hazards planning began over a decade ago in about 2011 um, with the Disaster Recovery and Redevelopment Planning. Um, it was a great effort that um, built on FEMA's uh, disaster recovery, a uh, new way of looking at how to deal with hazards. We worked with each of our communities. We have 11 coastal counties. We have 11 disaster pl uh, recovery plans. Um, they went through the vulnerabilities in each community to the hazards that that community felt was most important to them. So it covers the span of sea level rise, um, coastal um, high tide flooding. It also covers flooding as well as some more of the man-made disasters, whatever was really important to that community and to the um, residents within. So they created actionable plans that had short-term work programs. Um, or new updates are that some of these plans are getting rolled into co local comprehensive plans. Um, and one of the things we were so proud of is that it covered the entire coastal zone so all of our coastal communities could speak to this language of hazards resiliency and planning. Um, after Hurricane Michael affected southwest Georgia, this plan is now moving its way across the state and we're seeing other communities engage. The DRRP plans, as we call them, do have models for urban communities, beachfront communities, as well as rural and agricultural. So it's very adaptable and scalable. Another thing that's kind of built through all of our work is how to use nature um, in our resiliency planning. So a large emphasis on green infrastructure. Um, recently worked with one of our coastal communities to see how that would look at a scale of uh, community scale green infrastructure and changing out some of your um, traditional stormwater practices and implementing low impact development and how that affected your um, disaster costs as well as um, economic re recovery. Um, we also do an inventory of the low impact development practices across the coast and monitoring those and see how they are faring and trying to break down those barriers to implementation of those types of strategies at the local level. Um, also with the green infrastructure, we do work with our communities on living shorelines. We work with our residents and trying to understand how to manage their impacts from shoreline change as well. Sort of a different um, tone to resilience for Georgia especially is uh, what we're doing with all of our dredge materials. How do I go back? So this isn't really something that we thought about in terms of resilience 10 years ago, but now it's something we spend every day on. Uh, a lot of money coming into Georgia for managing our waterways, um, and we're recognizing the importance of sediment in our marshland system to maintain habitat, as well as provide that protective barrier to our communities. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about that ecological component to resilience um, and how to make our marshes more resilient, how to make our shorelines more resilient, and then the habitats that the, the coast supports that's so important to our economy. One thing we're um, working on is a multi-year strategy to sort of build everything together. We heard it from North Carolina as well, as developing these, um, what we're calling a resilience reference guide. So this is putting everything together of what the hazard vulnerability looks like in a, in a community, what the social vulnerability is to different hazards, um, who's being affected by these hazards, where are the hazards, um, what are the resources that we're worried about, what are our opportunities for resilience and adaptation, mitigation and restoration, um, and what are the strategies that we're going to use to bring all that together. So we're packaging this all up, um, trying to demystify resilience from a coastal po um, community point of view, um, and keep folks engaged, um, and then yeah, moving on, right? We kind of feel like we have got to start, like we were hearing some of the urgency, lots and lots of planning efforts, and so this is our next step to let's, you know, get more of this on the ground and really um, part of what we do and who we are. And then the last thing is the big question, like how are we going to fund all of this? There's a lot of money coming through the federal government right now, we know that. Um, but um, trying to match up needs to where the funding are um, with all the caveats and, and strings attached um, is difficult. Uh, we did support a Coastal Georgia um, fund funding resilience workshop recently that brought a lot of um, project needs together with project funders and trying to make some of those connections there. 
Uh, we're also working on a project to track our investment in resilience and climate change at the local level, um, at the Georgia level, really, coastal Georgia level, trying to make that story that we've done some, but we need help to do more. Um, and then we're also using some of our um, IIJA building infrastructure investment, you know, with all, all that federal money, to build capacity in our state um, to bring somebody aboard that can start shepherding some of these great ideas and projects, moving them into that shovel-ready phase, and then helping linking them to that funding. So hoping to, in the next update, to be able to talk about some of how these projects are getting in the ground, right? So that's what we're up to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jill. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Reed. And as the director of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, she oversees the Aquatic Preserve Program, three natural estuary and risk research reserves, the Coastal Zone Management Program, Clean Boating, and the Community Resilience Program. So she's got a great perspective on state resilience at the state level to share with us today. So I welcome. I know, I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, sucker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lindy. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you all for traveling um, far and wide uh, to come to beautiful Miami, Florida. Um, I do have the best job at the agency. I don't care what anyone tells you. Um, so resilience is, is really kind of a new word in the state vocabulary. Um, our office is a combination of all those programs uh, that Lindy told you about that have all been focused on coastal resilience in one form or another for decades. Our beaches programs have been helping communities since the 60s. Uh, the NERS have been around since the 70s. I'm not sure exactly when the CZM program came about, but about the same time. Uh, the Aquatic Preserve Program was started in the 60s as well. And all of them are looking at how we keep healthy coastal systems to help our state uh, provide that protective barrier uh, to help with our tourism, uh, to provide um, uh, you, know, uh, ec you know, the economics and the beauty that is Florida that brings people to this state. And it wasn't until 2019 with Executive Order 1912, which was Governor DeSantis's initial sweeping environmental policy, um, that we actually started using the term resilience. And in that executive order, it covered um, water quality initiatives, Everglades restoration, the state's first chief science officer, the state's first chief resilience officer, and then also created our office by bringing all those coastal programs together and then also adding in um, very strong resilience policies. So I wanted to kind of lay that all out there so that you know that we're looking at resilience on a lot of different levels, but the new gem um, in our crown is the Resilient Florida program. So it actually came about in 2021, so also relatively new, with the passage of the Always Ready um, bill. And this was passed unanimously in both houses, um, and it had some additional legislation in 2022 uh, that just helped with definitions and help, additional help for financially disadvantaged communities, et cetera. And the, the main point of this legislation is to say that for the first time ever, we have a problem with sea level rise and flooding, very important for the state of Florida. And then within that number, you know, the three main caveats are one, we need to prioritize our funding and make it to the, get it to the most critically needed critical assets within the state to help them adapt and mitigate. Number two, it's not just a coastal issue. It is a statewide issue. And if you look at um, NOAA's uh, coastal zone management designation, the entire state of Florida is within the, in the coastal zone. And then thirdly, in order to prioritize that funding and get it to the most critical need, uh, we have to have a statewide data set and a statewide vulnerability assessment. They're gonna help our legislators and our governor's office identify the prioritization for that funding. So it really has five key components to the program. We start with a planning grant program. We work with regional resilience entities to help our government statewide, our local government statewide. We have the Florida Flood Hub for Applied Research and Innovation, that think tank, um, that center of expertise that helps us look um, to projections that we need to be planning for. Uh, we have a comprehensive um, data set and assessment, so we have that statewide vision on vulnerability. And then we also have a resilience plan, which is a prioritized list of projects that our legislature can look to for, fun for funding in priority order on an annual basis. So the, we started off with the uh, Resilient Florida Planning Grant Program, um, and then last year we were appropriated $20 million. We were able to provide um, 
funding for vulnerability assessments for 21 counties, 88 municipalities, um, and these were these planning grants were um, given the foundation of statutory guidance for um, planning horizons, uh, sea level rise projections, a list of critically uh, critical assets that these vulnerability assessments should be focusing on. And the, the idea here is if we let locals do the vulnerability assessments at their level and identify their own critical assets, who knows the community better than the locals? So identifying those assets and then we bring them together at a state level and mosaic them together so we get that statewide picture. But it really needs to be driven at the local level. Um, also in this planning sector, we've developed uh, several um, uh, uh, assistance tools, if you will. Uh, we have the Florida Adaptation Planning Guidebook. It's available on our website to help those communities that are not very advanced uh, with their planning efforts. Uh, we have standardized scope of work uh, for creating those vulnerability assessments so that communities that don't have a lot of administrative support uh, can just hand a scope of work to their contractor. Uh, we have quarterly resilience forums, regular webinars, um, and then we also are working on a couple of adaptations. One that I'm really excited about is um, a, um, a suitability, um, habitat suitability analysis for living shorelines so that communities that want to add in those green components can have a guidebook for what's going to work in their region. Um, regional resilience entities, uh, these are groups of communities working together to support one another. Uh, we know that the more densely populated areas have the administrative support to complete some of this planning effort and have done so to date. Miami-Dade County has a really strong resilience effort. The Southeast in general does, but what about those other smaller communities? We need to bring everyone up to the same level. And we have a grant program that helps these entities to work within their regions. Uh, we also are working on the comprehensive statewide data set and assessment. So first of all, we need to get data from our local communities. Uh, we have been using a contractor to reach out and get any data that complies with the new statute. Uh, we've got about 30 data sets so far, but we've got 411 communities and counties within the state, so we've got a long way to go. So we're waiting for those planning grants that we funded and future planning grants to bring in that data so we can get that statewide data set. And then we'll be working on a model that will give us the vulnerability assessment we can use at a state level uh, to be able to prioritize our funding. And then the Florida Flood Hub, uh, this is our, um, our research branch, and they're helping us to define um, planning horizons, uh, rainfall projections, and sea level rise projections that we need to use at a state level and then on a regional level as well. And then the Resilient Florida Resilient Plan, uh, this is that prioritized list of projects that we submit to the legislature. Um, it's a three-year rolling plan, so looking at a three-year um, planning horizon. Um, and then we have submitted the first plan in um, December of last year. We just submitted another plan that's being finalized with the legislature and that they can consider this during the next legislative session for funding. Um, we've also helped the state's chief resilience officer, officer Dr. Wes Brooks, complete a uh, flood resilience and mitigation efforts report so we can look at the statewide vision on resilience. And then, um, so far to date, we've awarded about 189 um, grants to communities around the state, totaling $675 million. Now, this was supposed to have a couple of spin-up years for this program, let us do some planning, let us work on that data set, and then COVID funding um, came into vision. And so we've had a lot of support from the legislature to get some of these projects funded, get the money out the door, help our communities to adapt their critical infrastructure, and we've been, been very pleased in what we've been able to do statewide. So to date, uh, $40 million has gone to planning grants, $4 million to regional resilience entities, um, over $5 million in that COVID relief funding, along with the $471 million in state funding for resilience projects. And then I would be remiss if we didn't talk about $66 million that is, has gone to other initiatives, including coral restoration, the flood hub, and the Resilient Florida operational grant. So uh, very successful. I'd like to bring up the coral because they are a wonderful first line of defense here in the southeast Florida, and um, we'd like to support efforts moving forward. Uh, we are looking forward to the next legislative session. Um, we're prov proposing another $25 million for COVID relief funding, and then a total of another 91 projects um, in the state plan. So um, it's going to be another um, busy year for us. And um, I thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you after. Thank you so much, Alex. 
uh, exciting to move into the coral jurisdictions, and we're going to head to the two uh, U.S. territories next. And I'm going to um, welcome Hillary Lohman, who has worked in small island resilience around the Caribbean for almost 10 years, including work with the Dominican Republic, uh, with Barbados, Belize, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. She's been working in the Virgin Islands since 2016 and has been with um, with the U.S. Virgin Islands as the Coastal Resilience Coordinator since 2019, where I met her on her very first day. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Hillary. I'm going to talk about resilience in the Virgin Islands. Um, and perhaps to kick off my perspective of the territory's experience of resilience, I'd also like to discuss what I think resilience is and maybe calibrate some differences related to the, in comparison to the states as I <laughs> move forward. So resilience as a concept, right, is about relationships with change and being able to withstand them and then recover from them. Um, and I also really just want to point out that resilience depends on where you're at when such a change or stress occurs, like what state are you in? Is it pretty good or is it not that great? Um, and so, the Assistant Secretary General also spoke to some through lines that I'll bring up now that I'm here. The Assistant Secretary General spoke of places that still need data in order to even discuss adaptation needs. That's where we're at. So a lot of the points I'm going to make touch on some of the data collection that we've been doing and continue to plan towards. Um, another bit of context I think is relevant compared to my very esteemed colleagues with very organized programs is we only have one local level, level of government and it's currently very understaffed. So, and then a lot of the other states pointed to growing populations and the US Virgin Islands population is decreasing. And so these are stressors that lead to the work environment that enables a government and public structure to articulate needs and have the capacity to move forward on them. So with that in mind, I do have some other, I have some great pictures and some good news as well as some bad news. So um, I'm going to kind of go on two pillars of types of challenges to resilience, uh, shocks and stressors like events um, and conditions, as well as some context about being a small island and being a small island in the Caribbean. Um, so hazards and chronic issues, shocks and stressors, these events are intensifying or increasing in frequency. Um, and then they are just coupled, and I'll talk about what we're doing to collect data and understand those better, and then in response, how are we dealing with our geographic and population realities to make sure that we're moving comprehensively forward. Um, <clears throat> so again, a, th a theme of this has been partnerships, so I just wanted to say that, again, the things I'll be touching on, a lot of our partnerships, um, we are aligning programming and projects across our agencies and institutions to connect research, insert need for baseline information, um, and studies with management needs and what management would like better information on to make discussions and conversations. So a lot of this work is, I'm going to point to with myself, with the, our agency, the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. We also work with the University of the Virgin Islands a lot, and I'll touch on that, as well as um, BITEMA, our Emergency Management Authority. That's sort of our local emergency management arm, and that has a lot of access. We partner with them for FEMA funds, and our Department of Public Works has a lot of responsibilities and <laughs> skin in the game. So that in terms of urgency, um, we are also facing um, compounding issues, as a lot of places are. Uh, we hold our breath every storm season for storms, but I've heard in the news recently the term weather whiplash, and we're also dealing with that outside of storm season. So I, I'll go with weather whiplash moving forward, but I just tend to say flat, flood, drought, repeat, flood, drought, repeat. Um, our precipitation is really changing. It certainly affects when we're at the 17th latitude, people have been blessed with expecting basic um, rainfall to be to be nice. And now it's sort of it's we have no rivers, so um, capturing rainfall when it comes is critically important. But making sure that we mitigate flooding and maintain public infrastructure is important too. Um, so here's I'm going to move so quickly through some of our images. So again, here's an example. We have some really great data from our hazard mitigation resilience plan from the university coming out 
You can see that our development has increased and therefore so is our floodplains. There was a conversation that I really liked about stormwater, like changes are happening to our climate, but what we've done for the landscape to manage rainfall is changing too, so we're getting our arms around that. This is a new floodplain map that's different than FEMA to collect at a different method, like how, and it's a bigger footprint than the FEMA floodplain. Um, so here are just some examples of what this looks like. We have intensified rainfalls events, um, our unprepared drainage systems, so flash floods and stormwater runoff are a problem. In fact, just in November 2022, the local, the government closed early due to flash floods and like the roads, the conditions of the roads. Um, that was kind of the first time I think that happened. What are we doing? Drainage improvements at the watershed scale. So we use FEMA funds to develop a number of watershed management plans with a whole lot going on in them. One of the parts I'll t like mention here though is that they had recommendations for ways to improve drainage at larger scale. So this is an example of a project to install large storage containers, basically kind of peel back a field and put storage containers underwater to improve our ability to retain stormwater and then let it get back into our drain, our grain, groundwater system more slowly. Um, and on the other side, we also did a whole lot more water sampling, baseline data that we didn't really have before for what was going on in our ephemeral streams. Um, another challenge is coastal flooding. This is my beach volleyball court just in November. Um, we're back at it. Um, and this is a... a local business that's been there for ages. The shoreline used to be way far away, and now uh, you can look under the building. And sargassum is another issue that maybe I'll leave briefly, but it's definitely exacerbating what's happening on the beaches and the loss and removal of sand. Coastal vulnerability index, a um, lot of great data here. Some images I'll breeze through. We now have, we received baseline data, so now our next move is what are we gonna do about it? We learned about the shoreline type and distribution, the wave climate affecting different shorelines, um, characterization of shoreline infrastructure by type and by party, um, and also characterization of landscape change over time. So this is one of our marine protected areas in St. Thomas, the St. Thomas East End Reserves, the largest mangrove tract left in St. Thomas, and the first photo is 1954, and we've been tracking how all these things, and the last is 2020. Um, these help conversations with communities and government agencies alike. So then finally, uh, the small islands of the Caribbean, there's limited land, a lot of which is steep slopes or floodplains. There's limited water. We in the Virgin Islands do not have any rivers. Rainfall is as much an asset as a threat. And there's a limited population. We are now under 100K total. We lost, according to the 2020 census, 18% of our population, which is gonna affect our local economics when we only had a local government of funding to go with to begin with. It affects the dependence on imports. Our supply chain logistics are expensive and time consuming. 99% of food is imported. Um, so development and climate change are challenges when you're trying to balance a thriving community that depends on a healthy environment and you're working with a, some small rocks in the sea. <clears throat> so we're kicking off the comprehensive land and water use plan, which is a big deal because the territory hasn't done it before. That's gonna be coming up next this year. It's a roadmap to more holistic, large scale, island wide uh, balance of land cover and land use to balance conservation and development of the islands. It's too bad we didn't get there yet, but now we're in good shape because we have a lot more baseline data, high quality data. The university is doing a lot with all of our critical ecosystems to see which can, how they're withstanding and where to invest in conservation as well as restoration. And then finally, we um, produced this uh, social vulnerability index. We use the CDC's methodology um, to compute this at the estate scale, which is a geographic boundary, not really a governance boundary, but it's uh, pretty fine scaled. Um, and we would really say that the results show what we anecdotally and people's experience shows to be true. Um, we're really excited about this. We published with the National Hazard Center regarding the public health implications of social vulnerability, including exposure to flooding, water, and air pollution. Um, and we use this in management, used to identify areas to focus projects for restoration and infrastructure improvements, and to answer the newly popular question, how does this project benefit underrepresented, underrepresented communities? Um, and we're sharing it with diverse audiences and encouraging research and other people to pick it up and use it as well. And so finally, as I mentioned, just closing out the last that we'll be moving forward with our comprehensive land and water use plan 
as we're wrapping up our hazard mitigation and resilience plan and we'll be making sense and communicative materials with both public interest stakeholders and government agency stakeholders with some of the other materials, the, the shoreline changes and social vulnerability that we've found to date. And those are the updates from the territory. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hillary, for that perspective on resilience uh, from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Yasmin Detris, who's a uh, marine scientist with vast experience in photobiology, marine biooptics, and remote sensing. And she's been involved in projects related to seagrass ecology, implementation of green infrastructure to reduce sediment loads, nutrients and pollutants reaching coastal waters, and the impacts of sargassum in the tropical marine ecosystem. And a special thank you for uh, coming and uh, filling in for one of our speakers at the last minute. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. I really feel very honored to be here, and especially to be um, to be able to share with you uh, some um, of the most relevant initiative of CARICUS and key partners uh, to um, add, uh, uh, to reduce and, and work on in terms of um, uh, resilience in Puerto Rico. I am actually a CARICUS associate scientist and also coordinator for the Caribbean Regional Ocean Partnership. CARICUS stands for the Caribbean Coastal Ocean Observing System. We are one of 11 regional associations funded by NOAA that along with our federal agencies um, constitute what is called the US IUS or Integrated Ocean Observing System. Our program oversees uh, for Puerto Rico and the US Caribbean. Uh, CARICUS Climate um, Change uh, Partners are basically uh, the Climate Change Council of Puerto Rico, the NOAA CAP, or Climate Adaptation Partnership, the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources, Office of Coastal Manager Management and, and Climate Change, and the Puerto Rico Sea Grant Program. CARICUS provides uh, logistic, technical, and scientific support and our scientists have been contributing, contributing uh, for decades uh, uh, with information about ocean warming, ocean acidification, and uh, sea level rise. Uh, over the last five years, Puerto Rico and, and its residents have been subject to numerous and diverse uh, natural disasters that uh, combined with the debt crisis that we are living actually uh, in the island uh, that have exacerbated our island vulnerability and also has uh, triggered an economic and social crisis. So we have a big challenge <laughs> in the island. Um, let me then review some of the initiative from um, the different partners. Uh, first of all, the Law 33 of 2019, which uh, established the public policy of the government of Puerto Rico in relation to climate change, mandated the creation of the Committee of Experts and Advisors on Climate Change, or SEAC. Um, uh, the SEAC uh, is working in the resilience plan for the island that must be ready for December of 2023. Uh, they recently presented 103 courses of action to correct, mitigate, and prevent effects of climate change in coastal zones, and also publish uh, recommendations on climate change regarding uh, water resources in the island. Um, the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council also released the Puerto Rico State of the Climate. It's the most uh, recent report. It is uh, the official source of information about variations and, and trends in, in the climate of Puerto Rico. It is the effort of many individuals and, and institutions and summarizes the current status, trends, and project, projections for all the climate change indicators. 
Uh, there are many presentations and summaries available in Spanish, available for communities and for uh, uh, decision makers and different um, uh, general public. Uh, the Puerto Rico Sea Grant Program and the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center develop a Establish a collaboration since 2018. Most of their courses have been translated to Spanish in order to um, certify uh, people from um, different sectors, including engineers, emergency managers, etc. The DNER, with uh, funds from NOAA, also developed the Road to Resilience, which is a toolkit to, um, for community-led climate adaptation. And Caricus also recently launched in, in summer 2021 the Crop uh, Data Portal, which is a repository including 80 um, data products and visualization tools to facilitate access to these uh, products. Those products are mostly from uh, federal government and other uh, Caricus in-house products. Uh, our, um, our repository are classify, our products are classified in different categories, including climate change, coastal planning, and emergency response, which might uh, integrate products that might be of the interest of uh, most of you. Uh, Costa Viz uh, PR and Costa Viz USBI is one, an example of one of, of our in-house products. Is basically a visualization tool to understand land transformation as a result of anthropogenic activities and natural disasters affecting the coast. Uh, it uses your, your reference images that are dated back to 1930 in the case of Puerto Rico and 1965 for the case of um, USBI. Our up upcoming um, and new directions are involve um, reduction or prevention of coastal hazards and protection of the most vulnerable coastal communities. So in that sense, we are uh, we plan to continue the CARICUS, um, the evaluation of the status, trends, and threats of, um, of coastal barriers, um, mostly uh, um, with recommendations from the CARICUS Coastal Barriers Advisory Group, which is a group of experts. Uh, also, we want um, to conduct need assessments to understand uh, coastal communities and knowledge and awareness about coastal hazards and identify uh, their information voids in order to uh, develop new and tailored products co-designed with the communities. And eventually we will also uh, work in on uh, community outreach and capacity building. Finally, I would like to um, invite you to uh, visit our, our portal in there, we have uh, real-time observations, forecasts, decision support tools, and educational resources that uh, are available for the U.S. Caribbean and for um, any, any of you. Uh, that includes a, a handbook, a WAVE handbook, which uh, is being used by uh, at schools by the uh, teachers and students. Well, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so, thank you so much, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And I would like to extend another thank you and uh, applause to our our uh, presenters today for sharing such wonderful information and perspectives from across the uh, U.S., Southeast, and Caribbean territories. Um, we have a couple moments for, uh, for a question or two. And uh, anybody have a burning question out there that they want to throw out there? Uh, yes, burning questions only. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I, I do enjoy your presentations. And um, in the spirit of partnership, I was wondering whether or not there may be any resources for either thematic sharing or community sharing of some of these re resilience application of tools uh, between Southeast Coast and the Caribbean. Would uh, Caribbean want to 
like that? Sharing of tools between states and territories? Sammy, does this work? Yes. Oh, super. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that, so again, we lean a lot, so the Digital Coast is a great example of a place where there's a lot of tools. I will say that one of the things that's happening that everyone's working on is again, um, large initiatives come and ask local agents, local places for their data that then they can go back and do something great with to give back to you, but you would need to have that local data to contribute. And that's again, sort of where oftentimes the digital coast is a great hit because the products there are great and when we can use them, we do, but oftentimes it's a miss because we haven't been able to be to participate by contributing the data that would be made into a tool. And so from our perspective, I guess that's how I would characterize it. There are some things that we get a leg up because someone else was working on it at a, like a, at a larger level to help a lot of people that we are included in. But sometimes we have to be able to contribute things that we're still working on getting. And that can be a very personal, that, that's, when, that's, when it, that's when it's our responsibility again. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, yes, one more question. Alex, what measures are, or are you aware of projections for saltwater intrusion into our aquifers in Florida and the Florida and, and what measures we're going to take to have potable water? Um, great question, a little out of my purview, um, so I'll, I'll take the easy route. Um, we do have um, an alternative water supply grant funding program looking at these kind of challenges. Um, we also run the um, uh, permitting side through our Division of Water Restoration or Water Resource Management, and then of course we're working with our water management districts who are really studying this on a, on a daily level. So really a little out of my purview, and, and I'm happy to get you more information if that'd be helpful. Great, thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers in our session.